Welcome to the worship service of Wakeman Congregational Church. Glad you could join us. I hope that you are all uh, maintaining your, your composure in this difficult time. Hopefully in a few weeks uh, we'll be able to get back to uh, familiar things. I'd like to make sure you, underst- you, you know that uh, June 7th we're planning to have our, our first gathered service in a few months and we'll be meeting in the pavilion. We have an FM transmitter so that you don't even have to get out of your car if you're uncomfortable moving around. Uh, we have a, a, a frequency, I think it's 94.1, and you can tune into that when you come up near the pavilion, and uh, as soon as someone starts talking through the, uh, through the microphone and the speaker system, you'll be able to pick up and listen to the whole service. We will, of course, have chairs in the pavilion if you want to sit down and We'll try to have as uh, close to a regular worship service as we can. Hopefully you'll be able to join us. Also, uh, thinking about the, the time uh, apart from one another and uh, how all over the world uh, churches have been to meet, have been uh, meeting in, in, in unusual times and in ways, and I, I really pray that, that this time of, of quarantine and isolation will renew uh, an interest in fellowship, that there'll be a revival of, of churches meeting together wh- however they can do that safely. And uh, pr- pray, with, pray with us about that, if you will. Well, let me read a couple of verses from Psalm 27. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, Your face, O Lord, I shall seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not abandon me, nor forsake me. Father, we are so grateful that the one thing we never have to worry about seeing is the back of your head. That you are facing us. You approach us face to face. When we see you, we see your face. When we come to you, it's with your full attention. And we're so grateful that David left us with these strong words of confirmation that you won't hide your face, that when we say we will seek your face, you, we will find you. Father, I come this morning with, uh, um, and, and many across the world and, and churches around America are coming to you with with sorrow, uh, with joy, uh, because of the passing of Ravi Zacharias. Thank you, Lord, for this great man who spent his life showing others the way to Christ, answering questions, difficult questions, in a, in a precise and gracious manner. Uh, there's probably very few evangelical churches that have, had not, have not had some kind of influence from Ravi Zacharias. We thank you that he's with you now, enjoying his, his life in heaven. Pray for for his family, Lord, and for those he uh, has left behind in the ministry, and that you would continue to give them strength, and that his ministry would continue strongly. Lord, I pray for uh, those among our church who uh, are not feeling well, that are under the burden of some particular concern. Thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit who convicts the world of sin and righteousness and judgment and that those of us who are in need of of those things will will respond properly to the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you that he's a comforter as well and that you would continue to help us rely on, on the Holy Spirit and your word to experience the comfort and joy and encouragement that you promise. Pray that you would uh, watch, uh, watch us through this service, that you would guide our hearts and minds. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, kids. I'm glad you're here this morning. And uh, have you been able to go outside with all the rain we've had? It's been a lot of rain, hasn't it? Well, this past week, I was able to go to my daughter's and help her plant her garden. 
And we put in all different kinds of vegetable seeds, and some of the seeds almost look the same. You could hardly tell them apart. And the carrots and spinach, oh my goodness, they're both almost identical. And so we were getting ready to plant some things. <clears throat> and you can see back here, I have my little gardening basket with my tools and my gloves and some seed packets in there. And I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. But are you getting ready to plant some things at your house? Do you guys have a garden? Uh, this week I've sent you a few seeds in the mail or given them to your mom. And if you want to, you can put them in the ground. Uh, but don't plant them very deep. And it'll be a surprise what comes up. I will say they are f all flowers. So you'll have to see what kind of flowers you put in. And I have written on the back of your uh, seed packets that I've sent you uh, some directions about how to plant them. So uh, if you put them in, it takes about a week. So you'll be a little surprised on what comes up. And sometimes I have to save my seeds from the plants from the last year. And I just put them in an envelope in the Ziploc bag. And then I forget to label them. Now that's always a bad thing because so many, like I said, do look, do look alike. And so sometimes I just have to plant them and find out what they are and hope that they're not real tall or real short, depending on where I put them. Uh, but one thing is always true. Whatever kind of seed I have planted, that's the kind of flower or fruit or vegetable I get. So in other words, I can't plant a pumpkin and expect to get a tomato from that seed. It's just the way it goes. Well, did you know that the Bible actually talks about that? And I've asked Hattie to read this morning uh, a verse from the book of Galatians, and it's chapter 6, verse 7. So if you'd like to read that, Hattie, that would be great. It's on page 1299, and I know that you know where Galatians is um, because we already just looked at that not long ago. So Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and it comes right after 2 Corinthians. So go ahead, Hattie, and read verse 7 for us. Make no mistake, God is not mocked. A person will harvest what they plant. Thank you, Hattie. So, you see, the Bible mentions getting what you harvest is determined by what you plant. So, make no mistake, God is not mocked, or he's not going to be made fun of. Uh, a person will harvest what they plant. That's what scripture says, and that's true, right? You've probably seen that. But if you have your still, still have your Bible open, I want you to look at verse 8. And it says this. Those who plant only for their own benefit will harvest devastation from their selfishness. But those who plant for the benefit of the Spirit will harvest eternal life from the Spirit. See, the same thing in tr is true in life as it is in gardening, isn't it? If the, it? the verse said, if you were only looking out for your own self, and you're only concerned about what would be good for you and not caring about others, then you aren't going to get a very good harvest or return for that planting. Do you know a person who seems selfish and always wants the best for themselves? They don't have any interest in sharing. What are they planting? What kind of plant or harvest do you think they're going to get? Lots of friends? Sympathy? Kindness? Probably not if that's not what they're selling. That would be the same as if I planted only ugly weeds in my garden. What would be the point of that, right? Those weeds would block out my beautiful flowers and make them very hard to see. What would people, would they even notice the pretty flowers? They may not, especially if there's too many weeds. Well, the same thing is true with you. You may occasionally do some nice thing for someone, but that's not what everyone's going to see and remember if you're always being selfish or bossy or uncaring of others or angry. None of those attitudes or actions are nice to look at, are they? You probably don't like to be around people like that. Well, there's a few verses before the one that Hattie read in chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. And it says this, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. All right, which is a good thing. God never says, now, no more kindness, no more self-control. He does not say that. There's no laws like that. There have been quite a few laws about the quarantine, haven't there? Can you think of a few? Only go a certain way in the store if you go in. Always wear a face mask, right? Say certain distance away from everybody. But there's no rules about these kinds of seeds that you can plant. 
So I have my basket here this morning, my little gardening basket, and I have my packets of seeds in here. So here's some of my seeds. Love, joy, peace, patience. I think I'm going to get some good-looking plants. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. What kinds of plants do you think I'm going to get to harvest out of this? Some pretty good-looking ones, right? And that's what we want to be planting, um, is those kinds of things. And this verse is telling us that if the Spirit of God is in our hearts and our lives, then we will produce that kind of fruit. And others will see that in us. We'll have patience and not always demand our way every time we want it our way. We'll show kindness to others and do things for them because we care about them, not because we want to look good or we want something from them. We'll be self-controlled, not always giving ourselves everything that we want when we want it. We'll be joyful, not always pouting and grumpy. I have a grandson who has not been liking homeschooling, and uh, his teacher calls him Grumpy Cat because he just is grumpy. Every morning he has to start schoolwork. So you don't want to be that way. The Bible tells you to be joyful. We will be faithful to do what we're asked, and people will be able to count on us to do a job. Is that the kind of person you are? Is that the kind of seeds you've been planting? What kind of fruit will there be? See, does an apple tree have to squeeze its leaves together and just squish out an apple? No, it just automatically comes. It's an apple tree. It can't help but have apples, right? And it doesn't produce things like pears and all that. It grows apples. So those who belong to Jesus and want to follow him will have these good qualities starting to grow in them. It's just natural. They should be happening. So there should be some good fruit. Now, on your Bible, at the bottom of where we've been reading today, on page 1298, there's a little section here that um, I would suggest that you read. It's very good. It's called Christians Who Bear Fruit. And if you tell people that you're a Christian or you love Jesus or you want to live for Jesus, you're following Jesus, then it's a real good explanation of the kind of things that we should be seeing in your life, the kind of things that are, are in my seed packet. So if you want a really good challenge this week, ask these things of yourself. What kind of garden are you growing in your life? What qualities do people see in you? Do people notice that you're patient? Do others see you as a kind person? Or do they think you of you as a selfish, mean person? Do your parents trust you to be faithful to complete the job they've asked you to do? Or do they always have to keep checking on you because they're pretty sure you're not going to do it? Even if you say you are, do you actually finish the job? So plant your seeds and see what comes up. And I hope those around you notice some good fruit coming out this week and in your life because you want to follow Jesus and you want to live to please him instead of yourself. So plant your seeds, see what comes up, and I hope you have a fruity week. We're going to start a new series today. I'll say more about it during the message but uh, we're going to join together and sing Behold Our God, which uh, will focus us on the, on the topic of the message series. And please uh, join us in singing this, this powerful, uh, biblically accurate song and praise to God. words 
hearts of sinful men. God eternal, humble to the grave. Jesus, Savior, risen now to Would you please turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 2? I'm going to be reading verses 39 to 52. Luke 2, 39 to 52. When they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own city of Nazareth. That's Joseph and Mary. The child continued to grow and became strong, increasing in wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he became 12, they went up there according to the custom of the feast. And as they were returning, after spending the full number of days, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. But his parents were unaware of it, but supposed him to be in the caravan, and went a day's journey, and they began looking for him among their relatives and acquaintances. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem looking for him. Then, after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When they saw him, they were astonished, that's his parents, and his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us this way? Behold, your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. And he said to them, Why is it that you were looking for me? Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand the statement which he had made to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth, and he continued in subjection to them. And his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. This is the holy word of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the scriptures which tell us about you, which give us pictures of, of Jesus and his ministry and, and the, the gospels which are so rich in details 
that help us to understand what Jesus was about and why he came and, and how he lived and set an example for us to follow him. Pray as we look into this passage later, you would guide our hearts and minds, help us to glean from the scripture what we need to know for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. So you call your mechanic because your car is making a funny noise. And of course, you try to describe the noise to your mechanic over the phone. He says, bring the car in and we'll see what we can do. So you bring it to the garage and the mechanic says, pop the hood, let's take a look. And you say, wait a minute, it's making a funny noise. You should be listening, not looking. But of course we know the problem will not, will, will not be solved just by listening. It will need a look to decipher. When you visit a doctor, you sit down in the examining room and you hear that old familiar line, open your mouth and say, ah. And then you see that oversized popsicle stick come out. Your tongue is pressed down. You say, ah. And the doctor looks at your throat. You see, it doesn't matter how you say ah, whether it's melodic or, or sorrowful, whether it's high or low, what the doctor wants to do is look at your throat. Last week, well, last week we finished a, a study of Titus, and in that last message, there was a challenge to live a godly life because the world without Christ is watching how we live. Jesus gave the challenge to his followers in Matthew 5 to let, us, let our light so shine among men that they observe our good deeds, they observe our good works, and glorify our Father who is in heaven. Often, it is only after seeing our good deeds works that people will listen to our good words. How we look at Jesus will greatly affect how we live for Jesus. Remember how John the baptizer introduced Jesus? John 1 29, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Don't miss the point that beholding comes in the gospel before behaving. How we look at Jesus will greatly affect how we live for Jesus. With that principle in mind, we're going to begin a series of expository studies that will help us see Jesus more clearly so we can live for him more consistently. Our first look will be at 12-year-old Jesus in the temple, the passage we just read. Our last look will be at victorious King Jesus in heaven. I think it will be helpful before we unpack this passage to consider the topic of beholding God and viewing spiritual things. The prophets write about looking to God to be saved. Look to the Lord, the God of salvation, says Micah. Isaiah says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon the Lord while he's near. Jeremiah promises, you will seek me and find me when you seek for me with all your heart. You see the flow? Look, look, seek, seek. David prays, Psalm 27, 4, One thing I've asked from the Lord, that shall I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. David wants to dwell his whole life in the presence of Yahweh, to constantly behold the Lord's glory. When the Israelites were led the long way around to Canaan because of their disobedience. They uh, complained to God and Moses. The complaint essentially was, if you brought us out of Egypt just to bring us to the desert and die, we might as well have never left. There's no water and there's no food, and we hate this miserable manna stuff. Well, God sent fiery serpents among the people. Many Israelites were bitten and died. Of course, they repented and they asked Moses 
to help them get back on good terms with God. Do you recall what Moses did? The Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a standard, and it shall come about that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, he will live. And so Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a standard, and it came about that if a serpent bit any man, when he looked to the bronze serpent, he lived. Looking may lead to living. And Jesus applies this principle to himself. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. John 3, 14. Jesus says, the Son of Man will be lifted up. Look to the Son of Man. And in chapter 12 of John, he says, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. Looking at Jesus. Looking at the bronze serpent on a pole was a sign of faith. Looking to Jesus, the Savior on the cross, is a sign of faith. We used to sing about this when I was young. I, I, this, my, this song came back to mind when I was reading this passage. I'm a message from the Lord, hallelujah. This message unto you I bring. I, I give. It is recorded in his word, hallelujah. It's only that you look and live. Look and live, my brother, live. Look to Jesus now and live. It is recorded in his word, hallelujah. It is only that you look and live. Look and live, my brother, live. Lots of songs like that based on scripture. We sing some these days, some new songs in the same way. I hope you're beginning to see how vital and necessary it is to keep looking to Jesus. We've just, we've just touched the surface, just hardly gone even deeply into the skin of the many times that we have this idea of looking. The disciples had the blessed privilege of seeing Jesus with the physical sight. And I think John writes with great passion in his first letter these words. What was from the beginning, what we've heard, listen, what we've seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life, and the life was manifested, and we've seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us, speaking of Jesus, what we've seen and heard we proclaim to you also, so that you may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship indeed is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. What John saw, he proclaims now to us and those who read his letter so that we can all fellowship together in this wonderful vision of Jesus. We are compelled, I dare say we're commanded, to keep our eyes on Jesus. But as grand as it is to see Jesus, as attractive and inviting as that view may be, some are incapable of seeing him. We all were at one time. And even if our gospel is veiled, Paul says, it's veiled to those who are perishing. It's hidden. The gospel's hidden to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Jesus Christ. How tragic. How devastating is spiritual blindness. Those of us who know Jesus delight in our knowledge because our spiritual eyes have been opened. We see the Savior, but we're surrounded by blind men and women walking. I pray as we move through these, these messages and view the, the beauty and companionship of Jesus, consider His constant prayers for us, His gentle heart, His creative power, His grip, His infinite deity, His glorious return that will be moved by the blindness of our friends and neighbors, that those in our community who are sightless behind Satan's blindfold and will lead them to the cross where vision is corrected. The anchor passage for our study is Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. And so I would like it if you turn there. And let me read uh, just those first three verses of Hebrews 12. We're going to talk about these verses probably a, a few other times during this series. But, so I'm just, going to, I'm just going to say a few things, make a few observations now as we look at these verses. Hebrews 12, 1. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, 
Let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. See that last verse? Consider Jesus so you won't grow weary and lose heart. That's a connection, right? Therefore, of course, in verse 1 takes us back to chapter 11. We've, we've, we've observed this so many times. We see the therefores all over the scripture. So chapter 11 tells us about, answers the question of these, this great cloud of witnesses. Therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, well, who is that? Who are those witnesses? Well, that's chapter 11. Therefore, it takes us back there. The witnesses are the faithful men and women who are praised in chapter 11 of Hebrews. And these men and women show us that a life of faith is a life of blessing. We should follow in that path, casting aside all extra baggage. Certainly sin needs to be done away with, but we also might be doing good things when we could be doing better things. All the while that we walk and follow Jesus and run actually this race, we should be keeping our eyes on him. The New American Standard says, fixing our eyes on Jesus. I like that picture. Looking away from all earthly things that impede our progress, and speed's not the issue here. Direction is, follow Jesus. Keep our eyes glued. How will we do that? We don't have Jesus here like John and the apostles did. How do we see Jesus in our race of endurance? Well, Jesus himself answers the question, In John chapter 5, he challenges the Jews about their Bible study habits. Their aim was off. They were looking for the wrong thing. So John 5, 39 says, Jesus speaks, you search the scriptures, maybe put the emphasis, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. And you're unwilling to come to me that you may have life. You see the the error in their judgment? You look at the scriptures who think there's eternal life. They talk about me, and if you want life, you have to come to me. So where do we learn about Jesus? Where do we see Jesus? How can we live with Jesus in our view? From the Bible. From the Bible, the scriptures give us clear focus. Searching the scriptures is like putting the blinders that come on animals so they can't look from side to side. That's what the scriptures do. They keep us focused on the path in front of us, help us to keep from wandering. Well, that's been a long introduction, mostly an introduction to the series. But it's vitally important if we're to gain everything we can from the passages we'll study to have that kind of foundation. I'm calling this series Glimpses of Jesus. A glimpse is a passing look, a momentary view. The original idea of glimpse is a gleam of light. And you say, well, that's not much. A glimpse, that's all we get? Well, no matter how comprehensive our study of these passages might be, our sight of Jesus might be, compared to all that he is, what we see here is just a glimpse. And we'll take it. In the rest of of our time today, we're going to get to look at the first view of Jesus after his birth. The verses I read earlier from Luke chapter 2. The biblical record of Jesus skips 12 years of history. Jesus is presented in the temple as a baby. And the next event we read is Jesus back in the temple here in the last part of Luke chapter 2. What we do know about Jesus in the years before this passage is found in Luke 2, 40. The child continued to grow and become strong, increasing in wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Some people have written fictional accounts about the boy Jesus. They call them infancy gospels. In these gospels, false gospels, we're told of strange, spectacular, and I think even silly miracles that the baby Jesus, the young boy Jesus did. For instance, talking from the manger, healing a man who was made into a mule by a spell, bringing clay birds to life with a clap of his hands. Some of you even supposed that he healed people with with sprinkling from his old bath water. How ridiculous is that? 
What actually happened is far more important and far more relevant. Jewish men were required by the law to visit Jerusalem for the Passover, so we find Joseph and Mary making that trip in this passage in Luke. They visited Jerusalem for the Passover, and they'd been doing it for years. They came, they came faithfully. And on this particular trip, Jesus, who was now 12, was a son of the law and involved in the worship for the first time. Passover is connected to the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is an eight-day long celebration. Some Jews stayed the whole eight days. Some stayed just for the three days of the Passover events. We're not sure what happened with Joseph and Mary. We do know they went there. Were you ever lost? When our youngest son was about four, we went to a mall. We were in a toy store, and he stopped to look at something, and I turned the corner to the next aisle, and uh, Daniel went the other way and ended up in the mall by himself. Fortunately, our brother-in-law was standing by and some folks found him before he drifted off too far and we reconnected. He was only lost for a few minutes. Now, I'll tell you another bad dad story. We used to have a big van, like 12 passenger van. We had six kids, it was okay. Plenty of room. We're on our way home from church one day Supposing that Jonathan, our son, was in the back. We stopped by to drop one of our daughter's friends off at her house, and we, another car pulled up next to us and said, hey, you want to take Jonathan home too? And we said, sure, he's in the back, and he was in their car. Now, that's, that wasn't really lost. He never lost touch with anybody he knew. But still, it was only a very brief period of time. Imagine Jesus being gone for four days. No wonder his parents were distraught. He was safe enough in the temple, but Mary and Joseph didn't know where he was. And Joseph, they were frantic, especially Mary. Families and communities traveled together just to try to explain how this might have happened. How did they lose their boy? Well, families and communities traveled together on these yearly excursions. And so there were great, the the traveling group, the caravan we might call it, was extremely large. We don't know how many people could have been. It was just a matter of... of, um, who traveled together. In fact, it took a day for Mary and Joseph to realize Jesus wasn't with the group. He wasn't in my friend's car. He was somewhere, but they didn't know where, and it took him a day to find out that he wasn't with them. So maybe Mary thought, men and women sometimes travel together. You can see that kind of a picture, right? All the guys getting together, all the women getting together, catching up on the news. What'd you do in Jerusalem? Who'd you see in Jerusalem? Back and forth, all the conversations. So maybe Mary thought that Jesus was with Joseph, and Joseph might have supposed that Jesus was with Mary. And they finally got together and said, where's Jesus, our firstborn? We don't know. The discovery's not with the group. They head back to Jerusalem. And this brings us to the main part of the story, I think. It's about priorities. Mary and Joseph keep searching the city. They were continually searching for him. That's the the, the nuance of this idea, this, this looking When they got back to the city, they started looking and didn't stop looking until they found him. For four days, the only thing that was on their mind was finding Jesus. Four days, I say, they were gone a day. They came back that day. And they they looked a day, they came back a day, and then they finally started searching. And it took them a day to find him. Three travel days and one day of frantic looking. Where did they start their search? We're not told. Maybe they retraced their steps to go back where they'd stayed when they was there. Maybe they had friends when they were there. Maybe they had friends and they wanted to visit them. We do know this quote. They didn't find him gazing on the city's architecture or surveying its forms of busy life, but they found him in the temple. Not the most logical place for a 12-year-old boy to hang out. But Jesus was not a typical 12-year-old boy. Verse 46 tells us in Luke 2 that about rabbis and Jewish leaders gathering. They they sat on the terrace of of the temple on Sabbath days and feast days to teach and answer questions. And unlike all the other listeners, Jesus was answering questions the rabbis asked. A 12-year-old boy answering questions the rabbis asked. And he was asking them questions they could not answer just like when he started his public ministry. I love those stories where they, they try to confound Jesus 
in his ministry and he asked them a question and they have to walk away because they know to answer the question it would compromise their own uh, position. And in verse 47 says, all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. So his parents arrive, verse 48, his parents arrive and they're astonished, almost to the point of disbelief. Not because they found him in the temple so much as they saw what was going on. Is this our child? Is this our son speaking so eloquently with the, the leaders of, of the Jews? Remember that I said earlier that Mary was, I think, most troubled, the most troubled by Jesus' disappearance? And I say that because she's the first to speak. This is right in the front of her mind. She, she can't wait to see Jesus. She's so excited about seeing him and, she, and her anxiety is ceasing. So she asked him, Son... Why have you treated us this way? Behold, your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. The implication is that Jesus doesn't really care. But don't, let's not go too quickly over that. Behold, your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. But here's the key point. As I said before, it's all about priorities. So he said to them, Why is it that you were looking for me? Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house. Your father and I have been looking for you. Didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? The urgency becomes real. We don't, we don't know when the, urgent, the urgency for doing the ministry and, and understanding his father's house became real for Jesus. But as a 12-year-old boy, he was fully conscious of his calling. The King James Version says that, don't you know that I have to be about my father's business? But Joseph and Mary were trying to find where he was, not, where, they were trying to find where he was, not what he was doing. So location fits better. But the priority is still the same. It's a clash of priorities. Your earthly father has been looking for you. I'm where my heavenly father wants me. He was not seeking me. He knows where I am. Where else would a boy be but in his father's house? In fact, Jesus claims emphatically that he must be in his father's house. It's a matter of, again, priority. The temple was not just a place of worship. It was a place of instruction. Jesus' ministry was teaching the way to God. He had to be part of that. That was his calling. Now, there are questions that we haven't answered in this passage, and I'll leave that task to you. Questions are good. Ask them. Verse 50 tells us that Joseph and Mary did not understand what Jesus meant either. But we do have the whole story. These are the first words that Jesus speaks in the Bible. And they set the tone for his entire life and ministry. Jesus says that he had to be in his father's house. This verb is translated many times, must. He must be, I must be. Luke uses it 40 times in this gospel and in the Acts. It defines divine, it de defines divine obligation. Jesus lived to do his Father's will. I must do here. I must be here. I must do this. Hebrews quotes Psalms when it says of the Son, I have come to do your will. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prayed what? Not my will, but yours be done. His obligation, his priority was to do the Father's will. It was a must, a mandatory obligation. So what do we learn from this glimpse of Jesus? Here's the lesson. Make God's will your priority. Make the Father's will your priority. That's what you see when you look at Jesus in the temple. We're living in an I will do what I want world. We're attracted to things that please ourselves. We bristle at times when we're told what to do. And you don't have to confess to it, but I imagine there's somebody here who hasn't liked being told about wearing masks and taking six feet apart and all of that. Maybe I'm all wrong. Forgive me. Frank Sinatra, we know this song, and we, we, it's, it's, a, it's an icon. Frank Sinatra wrote the theme song for every generation. I find it also amusing to think I did all that, and may I say, not in a shy way. Oh, no, oh, no, not me. I did it my way. For what is a man? You know, the Bible asks that question in the Psalms. What is man that you, that, you, uh, that you will care for him? For what is a man? What has he got? 
If not himself, then he has not, nothing without me, to say the things he truly feels. And listen to this word, kind of, this, this phrase kind of sneaks in there. I never thought too much about it before. To say the things he truly feels and not the word of one who kneels. You see that? There's no submission here. The record shows I took the blows and did it my way. Yes, it was my way. That's, that's the song of way too many Christians, I think. Friends, we must kneel and submit to God's will. That's how we follow Christ. Jesus told us that when we pray, we should pray for God's will to be done. And Paul says, 2 Corinthians 5, 9, so whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please God. For me to live as Christ, to die as gain. That's so much different than this from that song, My Way. And now the end is near, and so I face the final curtain. My friend, I'll say it clear. I'll state my case, of which I'm certain. I live, I've lived a life that's full. I've traveled each and every highway, and more, much more than this, I did it my way. Listen, facing a final curtain without Jesus on the other side is a terrible possibility. Paul would avoid that. When we were in Philippians, we came to chapter 3 and here's his great statement. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Many of us are familiar with the uh, voice of the martyrs. Richard Wernbrand, who started that, his book called Tortured for Christ. He was in Romania during the times of World War II. And he and his wife, Sabina, saw Jesus. And they made God's will their primary pursuit. That meant years of imprisonment for both of them. And I want to share with you two illustrations that show how Jesus, show how much Jesus filled their vision. Richard was told not to pray while he was in prison. They kept coming by the, the jail cell, looking in the door, and every time he prayed, they dragged him out, and they beat him, mostly on his feet. But he kept praying. So he, had to do, he had to be where his father wanted to be. He had to do what pleased his father. One day a guard came by and yelled at him, what do you have left to pray for? And Warren Brandt looked at him with a smile and said, I was praying for you. Sabina was grabbed and put on a, a work team building a canal. The guards made fun of her, and one day, one of the guards pushed her into the freezing canal. As he came over to pull her out of the water, he said, Why didn't this God of yours save your life? And she answered, he just did through your own hands. There's two people who had their vision filled with Jesus. Take a good look at Jesus. Fully God, following an obligation to do his Father's will. When you're looking for direction, for where you belong, for what you should do, consider Jesus and follow him closely. Father, we do thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his life on earth. Thank you for his ministry. And thank you for leaving us with stories about his, how about his life. Fill our vision, Lord. That all may see Christ only always living in me. Amen.
Never mind, they'll be out. This will get cut. That last thing <laughs> will get cut because it's Friday, it'll, it's Saturday. So, yes. See, I think I'm really on Saturday or Sunday morning. <laughs> 